Since we first looked up at the moon and stars, we must have asked questions about our place in the universe. So how did life begin on Earth? Is life common out there in the solar system and beyond? Are there other civilizations out there waiting to be discovered? And what would it be like to live on other planets? Well, in this video, we're going to meet the scientists who are using cutting edge research to try and answer those questions. Twenty-five years ago, it was only the planets in the solar system that we knew. But since then, you know, we found about 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. So with the discovery of planets orbiting stars other than the Sun, everything has changed and nothing has changed. Now, there might be a large probability that there is another intelligent civilization somewhere in the universe. But we also have to recognize the universe is big, and I mean really big. SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We're looking for technical civilizations like our own, or perhaps even more advanced than our own. So today we are at Jodrell Bank Observatory. Uh, it hosts the third largest steerable radio telescope in the world. So one of the things we're trying to do is to look for artificial signals they have a completely different characteristic from the natural signals produced by planets and stars and galaxies. For example, on the radio, you would expect the signal, a technological signal, to be very narrow in frequency, very narrow band. And nature doesn't produce those signals, but technology and technical civilizations do. My area is post detection. So if we have the divide that the listening out there and actually picking up and detecting the signal, that's not my area. It's once we've got it, I need to unpack it. So by analysing over 60 languages and all the different ways we encode language on our planet, underlying it is one major truth that we've all got the same brain. Now, an alien brain may be different, of course, but the elegant way you structure such a complex phenomenon, such as language and communication, needs to be efficient and such that it has a fingerprint of its own. So you create a great big corpus, what we call it, a body of language that incorporates all the different ways humans do it, but also, as best we can, how animals do it. And so I look at everything from bees to humans, and in between it with apes, birds, and of course dolphins. If we know we're in a conversation, I would say the best way is to have a great hello there, this is us, simple message, and then build upon that. So behind that would be a more complex, more detailed message about us. And then we'll send that off and then wait for, in a generation or two, the response. What actually happens if we find extraterrestrial life? Because it could happen anytime. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen within the next hour. Now, when it happens, will it change something? Now, a lot of people will say, well, it doesn't change the price of beer in a pub. However, it will change perspective. If we detect a signal, it will be incredibly exciting. There's a huge, potentially a huge amount we could learn, um, not just about science, but about culture. Um, do they have religion? Um, do they love each other? Do they know about all these concepts? They have likely to have gone through phases of war like we have and come through the other side and learn from it and be better for it. Any advanced civilization would be that benevolent type of mindset. But I think the question is so important um, that we really ought to be sort of trying to do this. We really ought to be searching for these signals. We don't know whether we'll detect any signal from other intelligent civilizations. We've never detected one before. But one thing we know for sure, if we don't search, then the chances are zero. Since last year's Summer Science Exhibition, I've had three main areas that I've been developing. First of all is the post-detection framework. It will envelop everything post the signal detection itself. So after the search and uh, contact being made, 
or us being aware of some other civilization, we then go into an area which we call post-detection. Now, this has got a lot of work still to do, and it's bringing together a multidisciplinary team and a framework that supports it. So we have integrated different disciplines that are able then to work together and to be speedy and accurate in the analysis and the dissemination of information. So my research involves using telescopes like this one behind me. This is the Lovell Telescope here at Jodrell Bank. But I don't just use one telescope. You can do, and you might detect a signal, but you might not be able to see exactly where it's coming from. So to be able to do this, you can actually connect multiple telescopes together across the country and actually across the world too. So here in the UK, we have something called the eMerlin network, which involves the Lovell telescope behind me and also some other telescopes dotted around the UK. And the furthest one away at the moment is in Cambridge. That's about 200 kilometers away. Now we don't just stop there. It's something called the European VLBI network. And even though it's called the European network, there are telescopes as far away as in China too. That gives you a telescope the size of the world. You can really zoom in and precisely locate where that signal is coming from. Head shelf type 3 civilizations are advanced extraterrestrial civilizations that are capable of absorbing the starlight for their own use and then re-emit in the infrared. We selected 16,000 local sources that are near to us and we apply multi-wavelength analysis on the sources. As a result, we didn't find any sources that can be clearly identified as a Type 3 civilization. Therefore, this may lead to the conclusion that Type 3 civilizations are either very rare in the local universe or do not exist. One of the main targets of exoplanet research, especially in the light of biology on another planet, is the search for liquid water on a different planet. And my research is about the stability of liquid water on other planets. The actual surface can then have either liquid water at a given temperature range or that the water is actually not in the form of water itself, but rather trapped in some rocks, so-called phyllosilicates, so rocks that actually incorporate water groups into their lattice structure. My work has been on extending the analysis of the Breakthrough Listen SETI survey data of the nearest stars. We have used data from the ESA Gaia missions for second data release and its measurements of over 1.3 billion stellar parallaxes to calculate distances to these stars, which has allowed us to expand the previous analysis from 1,327 stars to a total of over 51,000 increasing the number of stars analysed for narrowband radio transmissions by a factor of almost 40. We have also been able to increase the maximum distance of observed sources from 50 parsecs to almost 10 kiloparsecs. Using the distances to these additional stars, we have also been able to calculate the minimum transmitter power that the radio telescopes used would be able to detect and placed much improved limits on the prevalence of radio transmitting civilizations within the galaxy my research focuses on clouds in the atmospheres of exoplanets. Clouds are important because they affect the atmospheric conditions on the planet. My research can be used to predict whether the James Webb Space Telescope, an upcoming space mission, can see through the clouds of an exoplanet, and whether the conditions on that exoplanet are good for the existence of life.